probably already have some sense of what is characteristic of critical theories in general, because all of us have learned at least one important, the foundational critical theory at some point or another in your lives. Specifically, what can you tell me that you remember from studying Marx at whatever point in your life that got introduced first? Karl Marx. Karl Marx. Uh, people first and equality of workers and the ruling class or whatever. Or like equality of everybody. Right. The biggest thing. Right. Workers' rights. What do you remember? Like that's pretty much essentially it. And that's what we're talking about in our Europe. Like I'm taking European history class. And so it's still oh, talked about a lot right now, actually. Oh, excellent. <laughs> so, okay. And it's mostly geared towards, you know, just that. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, since you're in the history class version of it right now, tell us a little bit about the background. Because one of the things we've noted repeatedly with our theorists is that theory is a product of the times in which it originates, its context. Mm -hmm. So what can you tell us about the context for Marx? Like about that time mm -hmm. that it all came out? Mm -hmm. There were really no rights at that point for workers, and everyone was kind of looking to, I guess, not rebel, but... So one of the points important is oh. to note that this is post-industrial yeah. re revolution. Mm -hmm. And one of the characteristics of the industrial revolution in theory terms is that we had a lot of theories that were produced about um, command and control, essentially. So, for example, um, the most famous example in OrgCon is Fayol, although there's several others um, writing around that same time. And, oh, and Taylor, Frederick Taylor is the other famous Orgcom theorist. And so Orgcom really gets its start around now um, with looking at ways in which to kind of maximize the efficiency of production workers. But that means a lot of work pruning the job down to its bare bones, right? We got, we achieved efficiencies through traditional scientific method, which means divide, divide into ever smaller units in order to kind of try to trace what the essence, if you will, of each of those units are. What that means for the worker is that now they are doing only one very small part of tasks. This is in stark contrast to the traditional European version of labor, which was essentially guild-based and craft-based. Yeah. Ships and you would, right. you would learn how to do the entire thing based on master and apprentice and go through the, the apprentice journeyman. And so it's not just the complexity of the task, it's an entire set of embedded social relations, both of which are now discarded. Hence Marx is reacting against this. What else do we know about the context for Marx? That's probably the most important piece. <laughs> The other important the piece is <laughs> the other important piece is uh, Russia's at that point in the midst of a very ugly transition from a monarch monarchy government to well at the time time kind of a chaotic uh, series of local feudalisms, but then eventually becomes what we know later as USSR. And Marx is. One of the theorists that is credited with that transition, anybody that suggests that the downfall of the Soviet Union proves Marx was wrong is misunderstanding Marx. Um, the Soviet Union never practiced what Marx would recognize as Marxism. Right? They, they practiced communism. Right. right. They, they acknowledge in some sense that they aren't really practicing Marxism. Western academics for a long time conflated those two, and so one of the reasons why critical theory functions the way it does in academia today is kind of a forever fighting from that under, underdog kind of position. And so uh, there's a defensiveness you'll often recognize in reading works by critical theorists. And that's not just because of the fact that they're 
fighting for equality, but also because in the, academe, in the academic setting, they're having to fight for legitimacy because uh, in the 1950s and 60s, there was a big purge in American academics, um, in which people you know, would lose jobs for doing this kind of work. Okay, so for those that are interested, critical theories are always going to be dissensus based i.e., yes, looking for equality, but doing so not by means of trying to create a single uniformity, but through trying to multiply, and in many cases, in fact, pr pretty much reverse current dichotomies. And so with Marx, your tr classic example is the property owners versus the ones who do the work, the workers, um, plebeians versus proletariat, mm -hmm. and actually wanting to reverse that power relationship. It's not that then you're going to be eliminating the means of production, you understand? It's that you're going to just be reversing the positions. And those differences still exist, right? There are still the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie will just not own the means of production anymore because that's thought of as alienating. They'll work alongside. Right. Um, similarly, then, standpoint theory comes out of, of the critical theory tradition. And rather than thinking about it in terms of classes economically based, we're thinking about it in terms of other forms of disadvantage. So the way that it usually gets appropriated into communication discipline is almost always through the work of a theorist named Julia Wood, who is interested in gender, the ways in which uh, women function as an underclass in exactly the same way and in which labor gets alienated. And so the production of work such as reproductive work, bearing of children, gets appropriated, gets controlled, and it seems like even naturalized that that control happens the way it does. Right? And so, classic example of working debates, and I don't know where anybody falls on those, um, but certainly it's an example of the ways in which the mechanisms of power alienate from the biological basis of power, right? Okay, <laughs> so long as we're not going to have arguments about that. Um, in the workforce, similarly, um, we talk about things like pink collar jobs and pink collar ghettos. There are certain forms of labor that become female dominated via one historical mechanism or another. There are no fields of labor that have always been historically gendered the way that they are today. It often seems natural to us that nursing, for example, is women's work. And that, as we know, the nursing field is, I think, something like 90%, 95% even, women. Um, I would not be the one to we, we can Google it if we <laughs> yeah. get it. hugely female dominated at any rate. And we today think of that as natural, as though somehow there's an essence of woman that is all about caring and providing support, emotional as well as physical and medical, right? But historically that was never true. And there's some sense in which that career gets ghettoized as it attracts more female laborers, um, you then get this glut of workers at, for a while. And so salaries are going to drop, basic supply demand economics, right? Those salaries then are more in line with what women make in other places. In fact, actually, they're a lot higher than most other careers that are female dominated. Right? Greater level of professionalization, 
today, of course, there's also, we've got a little bit of a reversal of that supply demand in economics going on. I, it's become so strongly gendered that it's actually hard to get men into that line of work. And so salaries have crept up a bit because of that pink collar effect. Nevertheless, the pink collar effect means that the nursing salaries, especially relative to other medical positions, suddenly started dropping right around the time that you get a lot of entry into that line of work at the moment. Whether this is a causation versus correlation argument, do you know what I mean about that? Whether this is correlation might be argued. Yeah, it, it's like correlation between video games and acts of violence. Right. Like they, we've seen an increase in both. In both. Right. But who do knows what or not is the cause. So we can make an argument that the pink collar effect is not the cause of that ghettoization. Nevertheless, we can see it in a lot of other cases as well, historically. Uh, when teaching became a female-dominated profession back in 1850s, 1870s, it had prior to that been almost exclusively male. Indeed, there was a time period during which it was considered scandalous for a female to teach a mixed class. So a female could teach, lead a sewing circle, for example, and that was appropriate form of teaching, but was not allowed to teach a group that's mixed. Okay. Right around the 1850s to 1870s, that started changing, again because of war demand. So it's a lot of supply demand economics, right? I, we did not have enough men that survived the Civil War. We just, we could not leave that profession. It wouldn't be filled if it weren't being filled with some females. And all of a sudden, pink collar, right, starts attracting. It today seems very natural to us that teachers of course, that's a female-dominated profession. Who's the nurturer in the family? Who's meant to be, biologically, right, the caretaker of younger people? Shit. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it's curious because um, you can see parallel trends as well with the, what I mean about the ghettoization. Increasingly, what you find then is that it gets professionalized in the form of separate education degrees instead of like overall degrees, like <laughs> subject-based, subject content-based degrees. You get your first education program starting in 1880, I think, are the earliest ones. And it's kind of hard to imagine at the time, but it would have been a very different, right? So you either got a theological degree from a seminary you wanted to teach anything related to philosophy or any of the liberal arts or anything like that, or you'd get a degree in engineering, for example, and then you teach those sorts of classes, all the science math classes. But you basically be teaching everything regardless, because to have a degree was to have mastered all of the above. Now we have education colleges. Salaries, gee, unsurprisingly. What do we know about education salaries today? <laughs> Relatively low. Right. Um, so you can trace that pattern. And similarly, you can trace patterns historically in the ways in which professions become male-dominated as well. There is not a single profession that historically and across cultures has always been think of things like agriculture for today, but you know, historically, a lot of cultures, the farming was done by women, the men were out hunting or trading more often, right, as civilizations evolved. Um, we think of things like um, science, which is the big one today, right, and you get comments from heads of like Harvard University saying that this has some biological basis, right? Again, naturalizing as though the Western standard today has some kind of inevitability to it, is a natural order of things. Uh, but in fact, in most other cultures, including, by the way, Russia, science was not so male-dominated. You can be 
places that have more socialist economies, more controlled economies, uh, they still are often 50-50. So the ways in which science becomes this strongly gendered, we can still see the outcomes today. I don't, you can't see it so much if you measure sciences across the board, because biology is by far the largest single science that we have. And biology has, I think, managed about a 50-50 split at this point. Maybe, if not, it's actually maybe 60-40 split. Well, uh, like for, in terms of majors, or? In terms of the gender of, of yeah. majors. Gender. Not in terms of the gender of the, you know, very high-end positions. You're yeah. right. You're right. There you still see a split. But that's as much about time as it is about the structure of the discipline itself, arguably. Not necessarily true. Um, and indeed, certainly it's a very long lag. If you want to make an argument that it's time-based, because in previous generations this was true, um, the norm shifts slower than the actual generations. If we define generations in terms of when years which is typically how we do define generations, right? That's yeah. no longer true, but that's when, when we used to make breaks between like the Generation X versus Generation Y. Yeah, Generation Y like started mid-80s, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. like yeah, I think so. Mid-80s to like 2000. Yeah, and so it's roughly a 20 year span. Others of the sciences are more resistant to change, and the hardest case usually is thought of as physics, where you still have roughly a 10% participation from women. The surprising thing is that usually the arguments made as to why this is natural and inevitable that fewer women go into physics than into, for example, biology, and why this is the one that lags behind so hard, is often based on math. Right? That women aren't good, in thinking in, good at thinking in 3D and that they're not good at the abstract math problems. Given that argument for why this is natural and inevitable, what's your first hypothesis going to be then? That's what's happening as to gender discrimination. Where would we look to test that? Uh, amount of time practicing math versus good or versus like scores and grades good good so one thing we would want to test yes is where does this if there is this difference where does this difference start appearing because it sure doesn't start appearing magically in you know your junior year of college which is when you lose most of the physics majors well, if we trace it historically back, though, women's scores at the SAT in math are on average higher right now. So it can't be that. What else would you look at to test that hypothesis? Would we be able to look across cultures as well? Yeah. Good. Good. And so see which of, if, if the French, for example, and the Russians, and numerous other cultures actually, are able to have roughly 50-50 representation. Is it that the women are going into less mathy subsets of physics? Or that or they're, that they're socialized not to. Right. So that are they getting extra tutoring in math going up through? But the other one that you might be overlooking as too obvious. If I'm hypothesizing, if I'm making an argument that it's natural and inevitable because of math skills and 3D abstraction, what happens with math as a major? It, it kind of just disappears because a lot of it is 2D about it. As well, that's true. 2D, okay, well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> there is some sense in which at higher levels, math is not about visualization at all. Or rather, it is, but it becomes 2D visualization because we're using computers to do the real work for 
fair enough. But we might point out that math remains almost perfect at 50-50 all the way through, including through grad school. OK, so looking at this problem, hi, Jordan. <laughs> I'm just going to keep going for the camera, if nothing else. All right, so looking at this problem, then, Sandra Harding, who is the originator of the term standpoint theory. Julia Wood is the one who introduces it, it into communication, but in fact, the, the bulk of the work in this, philosophically and empirically, has been done in sociology, um, in specifically in science and technology studies. And Sandra Harding is the person to look to for that. Harding is interested because she's going to make the argument that this has to do not so much with gender, but that it has to do with any kind of subaltern, is the term that we use for this. Subaltern identities. So minority identities, in terms of race, it can be based on economic class. Gender is also one source of subaltern identities. Um, reading disabilities, other disabilities would qualify as examples of subaltern, dis of subaltern identities. And her argument is that, in fact, the best knowledge comes from the perspective of the margins, i.e., these subaltern identities. That what you most want, if you want to improve knowledge and improve knowledge production, which is what we think science is all about, the way to do that is to look at it, study it from the perspective of subaltern identities. And Harding has some great examples that she pulls from both history and today. One of the most telling is that if you look at Nobel Prizes, for example, kind of the pinnacle of successful knowledge production. Almost all physics prizes, physics Nobel prizes, are given to individuals who are outside of the system in some way or another. Your classic example is Einstein. What do we remember about Einstein? Dropped out of elementary school, wasn't it? Or elementary school or high school? High school, um, but so did not finish any advanced degrees. What else do we notice? That's okay. Our European history will catch up with that eventually. Um, Jewish. And so religious minority, which is actually really relevant at that time in Europe. Also, during the years in which he was actually producing the work that eventually wins Nobel Prizes, he put together the four most critical papers all in a single year, 1904 when he was working as a patent clerk. Not a research scientist. And the argument is that it's not coincidental. Harding's point is that going through the professional power structures, the professional hierarchies have a vested interest in defending the theories that they've come up with. And that they believe is true. Right. And so if you want test knowledge claims, if you want to come up with anything new in science, you're going to have to look at it from the perspective of the margins, because the vested interests are too vested. And so we find lots of examples. Most of the prizes are for work that was done very, very early in careers, like start of grad school early, and not yet fully professionalized into the norms of the discipline. And while the work obviously gets continued past that point, and it's often you know, long gaps between when the work was done and when the Nobel Prize is awarded, and when we recognize it for the value that that knowledge is, um, nevertheless, you can almost always identify. It's also, for example, often scientists who are coming in from different cultures, India, for example, or coming in from economically disadvantaged backgrounds. If you trace, for example, average income, historical income, right? So childhood up, what class did they get raised? 
for most scientists, it's relatively middle to upper. Uh, but with your Nobel physicists, it's markedly better or much lower, typically, historically. And that pattern is not vastly different in sciences like Nobel chemistry prizes, uh, Nobel prizes in economics. Yeah, so like the economics ones, you can also see a lot of examples. The one from Africa most recently, uh, minority women planting trees as an economic uh, invention, if you will. New knowledge, hmm. returning to the very, very old, right? If you want to have better agriculture, plant trees. <laughs> we lost that somewhere along the line, though. We lose everything somewhere along the line. Mm -hmm. right. That's why everything that seems new is actually old. So, she's making a pretty strong claim that what we need for knowledge production is to deliberately privilege these minority and mar marginalized identities. Um, you can see it in practice getting done in a lot of different places. So for example, mo much of the brain research today includes people on the teams that are affected by brain differences. So for example, I have a student who was pretty seriously autistic and is now part of a team studying treatments for different ways of um, chemical treatments for brains that are autistic. So there's a lot of places where we can see this working really nicely. What's problematic about this argument that Harding is making? Where would you critique that argument? marginalized in one way or another and do science from following their suggestions. What's yeah. problematic about that? That would be the that would just become the new norms and you're just switching out around which would be the considered the minority group. Right. Right. And so always we're going to have dissensus, right? Different differentiality of positions. We're never going to see eye to eye. We're never going to all be in the same place in terms of our standpoints. Nor is it the goal to be in the same place in terms of our standpoints. We actually want to maximize those differences. We just want to make more room for those to be seen. So one of our tasks should be to try to figure out ways to flex our own standpoint and try to bring our standpoint into a place where we can understand the standpoint of others better, including more diverse others. Uh, one of the other things, though, that Harding's standpoint theory, the way Harding conceives it, suggests as a solution, as at least a, as a helpful measure. We were talking before about how subaltern identities come from a lot of different places, and we know that every individual is composed of multiple social roles. So if we buy into what Harding is arguing, one suggestion would be that it should be possible to prioritize or, or to think from that element of our, our own identity, that part, portion of our own identity that is altered. And that should have some of these same desirable So your religious identity may be, you know, mainstream majority, but maybe your economic background is minority, or maybe it's that your um, personality, right, Invert, introvert versus extrovert, maybe that's what puts you in a marginalized position, and thinking through life from that perspective will help with getting out of, you know, the hierarchies and boxes that are social norms right now. At least that would be the argument. We would still never expect to be able to achieve agreement. There's no reason to think that approaching things from our subaltern or trying to maximize 
the marginalization of our own perspectives, our standpoints. There's no reason to think that that's going to bring us into greater agreement. And so the other critique to this, to Harding's work, and to critical work in general, is that as a practical matter, I don't really want to go overthrow all of the way science is produced today. I mean, norms tend to arise for a reason. <coughs> that reason might be different now, and it might need to change because you know things evolve. But in general, our cultural adaptations occur because they're functional at some level. And so large-scale change is, is often creates problems as much as it solves other problems. <laughs> and so if everybody is trying to now approach from their subaltern perspective, their marginalized perspectives, um, we're going to be in for a pretty rough time trying to maintain stabilities, arguably. So, like, just like switching between programs almost. Mm -hmm. You've got to debug. Like, you're making a new program, so you got to debug the problems and make sure that it fits in. Like, it's worse than that. It's worse than that. Society. It's not just switching programs, it's actually switching language. Right. Oh. My programming language went from COBOL to Java. Oh boy. Now what am I going to do? Because pretty soon I'm going to have lost everybody with the old COBOL programming skill. Right? That's what Y2K was all about. Nobody here remembers Y2K. But <laughs> around the turn of the millennium, there was a big panic because many of the software programs that we were dependent on institutionally were written, you know, in the older languages, Fortran and COBOL. And we didn't have anybody who was programming actively in those languages anymore. It's all this legacy stuff that gets built up in layers. And so we were convinced the computers were going to shut down at the turn of the millennium because we couldn't reprogram the old language. And it wasn't set up to handle the change in the first two digits, it could only handle changing the last two digits of here. As it turned out, it was not such a big thing, but there was a lot of money that got, um, well, I'm not going to say wasted. All of a sudden, we had a lot of old programmers being dragged out to try to train up very quickly the young programmers who were familiar with the newer languages and try to reacquaint them with the older languages, having lost our sense of history in terms of the programming. And, and so it becomes institutionalized in that way. So we could have achieved certainly more efficient ways to go about that changeover. How does this apply to communication then? Well, one of the ways it applies to communication is that it asks us to be sensitive about institutional economic norms in things like media. And if you follow critical discourses at all, you're probably aware already of the ways in which media conglomerates are increasingly centralized, right? Like four big companies in one day. Right. Exactly. And so, while it looks like you have a lot of diversity in your television programming, thanks to cable, in point of fact, there's very little difference. Similar with radio. Radio is a curious, curious technology because in its infancy, it was an exceedingly democratic means of communication, i.e. what you had was ham radio operators. Oftentimes, the people doing the radio operating were the ones who built, right? And so there's this whole hobbyist approach where everybody is their own inventor. And the means of production are entirely within this social network. Right? Okay. Today, radio obviously doesn't operate that way. It's a mass medium. Uh, you have a grand total of pretty much one radio station owner, Clear Channel, that does different formats. And so the fact that you have, what, 10 radio stations in town, it looks like? No, I'm not sure. You've got 103.9, 95.0, whatever. So you've got about 10. It's been a while since I've listened to radio. <laughs> <coughs> You've got a grand total of two owners, Clear Channel and Public Radio KUAC, which is a nonprofit operated through UAF. And so critical theory 
Harding would suggest that we would expect to find differences in terms of, for example, the role of advertising, the kinds of things that get said on the news, on the radio stations. Um, it would be not surprising that the only one where there's any sense of a public voice anymore is the one that's a nonprofit. Right? And so for remote communities, where radio still functions much more on an older model, Right, with Collins, and the, you'll have entire the bulk of your programming on some of the channels will actually be call-ins. Right, call-ins who wish a happy birthday to somebody who lives in a different town, call-ins to say I have for sale this, because that's your primary means of communication. It's not so much mass com as it is stuff like social. Inter media. Yeah, exactly. It's filling every community for the niche, both inter personal, organizational, and mass, right? And it's probably unsurprising that that's not commercial. <laughs> Similarly, we would ask to look at things like education with a pretty critical eye. What is it that we are, we've, we've got these new Common Core standards, right? What do we know about Common Core standards for education? No, okay. So it's okay. a perspective change, something that they're, they say they're going to introduce into school systems and something like initially 38 states had signed off on this. Um, many of those states have now backtracked. So it's not clear where Common Core is going at this point. But we would certainly be asked, Harding's standpoint there suggests to us to look pretty critically and say, okay, who are the winners and who are the losers? under this common core standardization. Indeed, in any standardization move, there are going to be winners and losers, relatively speaking. And so to look critically at what are the standpoints that we're ruling out as possibilities, essentially. What do we lose? Like all of us, by eliminating these margins. Does that make sense? And it's not just about race. The common core standards are created essentially by business interests. And so in doing that, what do we lose in terms of civic interests, for example? Does that make sense? No. It's no. Well, <laughs> Jordan says. I, I, well, we've seen, we've seen what caffeine does to the spider, so. <laughs> and make sure yes. everybody can get to different places. So that it essentially, in some sense, argued to be training towards a kind of a middle ground and eliminating, yes, maybe we can argue that we're eliminating the very low margins if we are successful with Common Core, i.e. not going to have anybody that's illiterate, like literally, completely unable to read. also not going to have very much by way of no more, you know, honors curriculum, no more advanced kinds of alternative curriculum. It becomes much harder to do seriously different pedagogies, like, for example, um, Walden or like uh, Montessori. Montessori, which is so, you know, text-based, is not going to fit well with the curriculum that has an emphasis on things like being able to apply statistics, right? Oh. Jordan is still not convinced. Oh, I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's okay. You'll become a you'll become a, a proper opponent to Common Core curriculum once you start seeing the uh, the testing protocols as well and how very expensive that gets and how often it fails because technology is layered and so we're counting on these different layers of technologies to play nicely together and they're not gonna. I mean, we can predict with relative confidence, I think, that there's gonna be glitches in the system as we start. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think anybody right. feels like we would lose money on a bet like that. So the proposal is that on Wednesday, think through, read over the, what the textbook says about Harding, but think through in general kind of this broader approach I've tried to give you about that it's not just gender, it's a lot of different identities that are relevant for standpoint theory. And try to come up with an education system that would be consistent with this approach to epistemology, to knowledge production. You can either suggest to me one or two key ways of changing the current system to try to bring it in line with Harding. What would be the thing, the reforms most in need and why? Or you can overhaul the entire education system. And I would love it if somebody could come in with something truly different as a starting point, maybe drawing on the old apprenticeship models or maybe drawing on some other models of education. Um, because other cultures have done education in a lot of different ways. And this, the ways in which we socialize children in the classrooms today is very much a product of that same industrial revolution that led, led, led the workers to revolt, and I suspect is eventually going to lead, lead to revolt among current working students as well. Yeah, isn't, isn't it still based on like uh, socialization? workers, like time, like specific time. All tables. about time management, Break. about control, it's about, you know, understanding different roles and knowing your role and how to not violate your role boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, our current education system is very much a result of that same industrial revolution. And so it makes sense that we need to be thinking about ways to reform it anyways. Right? The same way that Marx is arguing we need to overcome, to change around our economies. Now, to what extent we've succeeded, but it's certainly no longer a clear cut model of proletarians versus pro bourgeoisie, right? It'd be, I think you'd be hard pressed to say who are the bourgeoisie today? Because I think, with the exception of maybe the 1%, um, I think everybody kind of feels like their, their labor is not their own, in some sense. Um, even, the, even the 1%, it depends on how they got there. I'm sure. I, I've never known anybody who's anywhere close to the 1%, and so I've never gotten a chance to ask it or hear them talk about the ways in which it still feels alienating, but I suspect you're probably right. Yeah. So, while we've changed from the Industrial Revolution model, we're still struggling with the problem of alienation that Marx had identified and that we've been living with ever since, for sure. So that's what I'd like you to do for your Wednesday. And then Friday we'll get together and we'll have, again, a choice of two articles, neither of which is up on Blackboard yet, but they will be, because I actually do have them, unlike the ones that I was worrying about for the narrative week when I only had one of them. Okay, thank you. You're free to ask questions, by the way. <laughs> you frown at me lots. <laughs>